Welcome back. So I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you some further about this great, great subject of defiance writ large as being the secret of life, but the specific example of fidelity enhancement beyond what one can get out of equilibrium in the form of ideas like the kinetic proofreading idea advanced by John Hotfield and Jacques Nineau in the early 1970s. So brilliant, so cool, and uh, really, really interesting. So um, so what, what are we talking about? You know, in the last vignette, I introduced this idea of high fidelity and the metric for high you know in order to, in order to use superlatives we need to compare i'm not allowed to say that something's fast or slow or big or small unless i say with respect to what and in this case when i say high fidelity i mean with respect to what one can get out of equilibrium codon anti-codon binding in terms of number of hydrogen bonds which corresponds to a certain number of KTs of discriminatory power between the correct and the incorrect messenger, sorry, between the incorrect and correct tRNAs. So here I show you a, a schematic of, you know, kind of a cartoon version of a Maxwell demon that we imagine is presiding over the process of translation and making sure that the ribosome only allows in at the A site the correct tRNA, okay? so. That's the picture. And what we're gonna do is I wanna try to put that picture into action. And last time I already gave you the essence of my representation. And this is, a, this is kind of incomplete. I'm, I'm trying to give you an intuition for the effect, um, for the idea of kinetic proofreading, but it's not precisely the way you'd find it in, in the papers of Hotfield and Nineo. Hopefully I'm not making any big conceptual mistake the way that I try to formulate it. I don't think that I am. So here's the, the point. I have an enzyme which shown, is shown in green, such as the ribosome, for example, but it doesn't need to be that. There are two substrates, which I've, I told you in the last vignette, I'm gonna label as blue for the correct one and red for the incorrect one. And now what I'm imagining, and you will work out in the homework that I handed out yesterday, what I'm imagining is that there's an initial equilibrium discrimination. And we used the states and weight di weights diagram yesterday to try to indicate that. And what I mean by that is that we have the, the messenger RNA and the tRNA is going to do its recognition and it will bind with an energy delta epsilon R for the correct one, for which R for right, and it will bind with a, a binding energy delta epsilon wrong for the, the incorrect one. And the ratio of correct to incorrect binding events is given by the ratio of those Boltzmann factors. So it ends up being e to the minus beta delta epsilon, and that can be recast in the language of ratio of um, the ratio of the KDs. Let, let me try to be more concrete. So the probability of the, of the right one binding is in the language that um, that I wrote yesterday, and this is what you will do in the homework, so I'm kind of giving you the answer. Um, this is the probability of binding the right one. The probability of binding the wrong one is C over K wrong, and then one plus C over K right plus C over K wrong, where in the denominator I have the partition function basically, basically in the states and weights, and this tells me that P wrong over P right is gonna be given by uh, C over K wrong over C over K right, which is going to be equal to K right over K wrong if C right equals C wrong, okay, which I kind of was implicitly assuming, but in fact is not true in the sense that if I consider the right tRNA and then I consider the suite of competitors, we're talking about a ratio of sort of minimally 30,000 to 300,000 meaning that there's way more wrong ones than there are right ones. At any rate, without going into too many detailed calculations, what I'm trying to argue, what I argued just with this little calculation that I did, is that the ratio of the right to the wrong is given by the ratios of the KDs, basically. Although note that they're inverted, okay? So here, the reason I say inverted, this is P right over P wrong, it ends up giving you K, R, K right over K, K wrong. And you would think that K right should be smaller than K wrong, right? A, 
And a dissociation constant, the smaller it is, the stronger the binding. So that's the, that's the idea in play. So the, ne the next idea is that work is performed. Energy is consumed. A hydrolysis event occurs. And as a result, the system is, the way I think of it is the system is reset. The stopwatch is reset. And now the system has the chance to actually reject the substrate again. Now, um, I'm going to make a point of this. I'm, I'm very hung up on this in general, which is that one of the beautiful things of the 19th century was that many of the experiments that people wanted to do were based on basically hanging weights. So every so in the upper left, I'm showing you the experiment of Joule, where he showed the mechanical equivalent of heat. What he did is he lowered a weight that turned a propeller that heated the water. You can see the thermometer in the left hand side there. And then by measuring how much the heat, the temperature was raised and using the formula that the heat is given by the specific heat times delta T times the mass or something like that. And knowing the MGH of the weight, he was able to find the mechanical equivalent of heat. That's great. And then I showed you the device of Gay-Lussac that uh, was in the Paris Museum of Art and Metier. Art and Metier. And, um, and that one, you'll recall, was the one for measuring the relationship between pressure and volume and that sort of stuff. And there also it was by hanging weights. So I'm very intrigued and in general by the idea of all of our modern contrivances, to what extent can I map them onto the hanging of weights or the pushing in of pistons and so on. And I think it's actually very valuable forcing ourselves to think in that kind of language, sort of the equivalence of hydrolysis to mechanical work. In the upper right, I'm just showing you that, you know, when you pull on a molecule in an optical trap, for example, let's say we're stretching DNA, there's an entropic force having to do with, with pulling out the wrinkles in the DNA. And we, when we write the free energy, we include for sure that entropy, but we must at the same time include the, the energy of the loading device, which can be thought of as the dropping of a weight. When I pull the trap, the bead in the trap out of its focus, I am actually equivalently lowering a weight because I'm going up the one half kx squared of the potential that the trap uh, signifies. And so anyway, in general, I'm just trying to say that when I think about this Hopfield scheme, whereas they were thinking about the consumption of ATP in a step like this, where there's, there's this investment of free energy, I'm going to think about pushing in a piston, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a few minutes. Okay. So the idea, just to recap, is that there's the initial molecular recognition event, which is dictated by the KDs. So the right and the wrong are both dictated by their respective KDs. But then we do some work. This, the enzyme goes into a new conformational state. This is the new conformational state. It is now competent to do the enzyme action. And I reset the stopwatch, and now I have two competing processes. At that moment, when I reset the stopwatch, I change the conformation, the enzyme becomes uh, active and therefore competent. At that point, there's a bifurcation diagram. And the way I think of it is shown here. So what I mean by that is that at that moment, the moment which we, in which we push the piston in and we induce this conformational change, the bifurcation is either the substrate will be cleaved, that's the right-hand pathway, shown here, or the substrate will fall off, and that's the pathway shown here. And all, you know, qualitatively, what I want to say is that the fraction of result reactions resulting in cleavage is given by, given by R over R plus K off. Let's, let's just review the limits. What am I saying? I'm saying that I reset the stopwatch, I'm now at this moment, the stopwatch is pointing here, and now I start the stopwatch running, and two things can happen. Either I do this reaction and I cleave this reaction, or I do this reaction and the substrate falls off. Let's think about the limits. In the limit where R is huge, so the rate of reaction is very, is very large, then in that limit, the probability of cleaving is, is high. And so my little expression R over R plus K off seems plausible. Let's think about the case where K off is very high compared to R. 
then in that case, the thing will fall off and it doesn't get to cleave. And so the probability of getting cleavage is, uh, goes to zero. So this expression that I've written here, r over r plus k off, I can formally derive that. And actually, I think I'm going to have you formally derive it in a homework. It's really fun. Uh, it's one of my favorite calculations that I've done in the last five years or so. Um, it involves exponential waiting time distributions and so on, a bit like convolutions, uh, but in a, in, a, in a nice sort of transparent way. And so you can formally derive this, but I'm just doing it by scratch and sniff. I'm saying I have a bifurcation. There's two things that could happen to me. And the relative probability of those two outcomes depends on the relative strengths or the relative rate constants. If the rate, and, I, and I used the limiting cases to argue for the correctness of this expression. By looking at large R and large K off, uh, I see that the probability of doing the reaction uh, is measured by R over R plus K off. What that means is that the fidelity of this step is given by this ratio. The fidelity of the proofreading step is given by this ratio. And what that means is that the fidelity of the entire process is, well, I, I first ask what's the probability that I've got the right substrate at the, at the time of binding. And now I push in the piston and already I've done a first round of discrimination. And now I do a second round of discrimination. And so the total probability, so the total probability uh, of right versus wrong um, is gonna be equal to uh, K wrong over, uh, oh, sorry, k right over k wrong, if I'm k right over k wrong, times, and then r plus k off right over r plus k off wrong. And that's the total discriminatory power. So let's, let's write that. So this is total discriminatory power. Or outcome. Okay, so you know, maybe I should just try to recap. So conceptually, um, what I was claiming is that the idea is that by doing work on the system, we get a chance for a second pass at discrimination. So that's, that's the first point I was making. We used the concept of an allosteric transition to make the point. What do I mean by that? Here, I've got an enzyme shown in green. And in this conformation, the one on the left, it's inactive. It cannot cleave. But there is an allosteric effector shown here in yellow. And when the concentration of that effector gets high enough, so effectively what I'm doing is I'm using the piston as a trick to change the concentration of the effector. It's not that I pipette in more molecules. I just take, I have one molecule of effector sitting there and I, I compress the piston and that changes the concentration and at sufficiently high concentrations, it binds the enzyme. And when it binds the enzyme, it changes the level of activity. So here I'm in the active state and now it is competent, as I noted before, to, I, to cleave either the correct or the incorrect substrate. And the, the point was that the right and the wrong substrates have different waiting times. They have different off rates. So the off rate gets translated into the waiting time. If you go back to the very beginning of the term, when I did the great probability distributions, one of the ones that I did was exponential waiting times. And, um, and you'll remember that the off rate determines the, the the average lifetime, one over the off rate is the average, life, average lifetime. And so a larger off rate means a larger KD. I'll just remind you, KD is equal to K off over K on. So if I have a larger K off, I'm assuming that all of the, the wrong and the right guys have the same K on. Why? Because I'm thinking of that as being diffusion limited. In other words, the rate at, at which the substrate arrives onto the enzyme is just dictated by diffusion. And there's nothing about right versus wrong that's gonna alter those rates. The K off is different. The Velcro, the stickiness onto the enzyme is different for the right and the wrong substrates. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, COVID, no, I'm kidding. So uh, <laughs> I, 
um, I'm saying that the off rate for the wrong guy is higher, and that means that the, the waiting time distribution is steeper, as you see here. And so it has a, if I wait a certain time before doing the reaction, then the, the, the wrong substrate has a higher chance of falling off before being cleaved than does the right one. So that's the, that's the concept. And, um, and then I try to make this argument about the bifurcation. So I have two, poth I have two possible pathways, um, and, and uh, they have different rate constants. And I'm just saying that the probability of getting one of the outcomes is given by the rate constant of that outcome divided by the sum of the rate constants. That's, that's a derivable result. I gave it to you by scratch and sniff, and I'll have you derive it in the homework. It's really, uh, it's really quite cool. And so the outcome of all of this is that we find that the total discrimination is the ratio of the KDs, but times this extra discriminatory factor. And notice, if K off is much bigger than R, then I'm left with K off wrong over K off right, which is just the ratio of the KDs again. And so I end up, as I, as I claimed yesterday, with uh, the total discrimination being the ratio of the KDs squared. And that's kind of one of the original outcomes of the um, thinking of, of Hopfield and Neo. Um, I guess I, I just wanted to say that people, this is for example from a paper of Pankaj Mehta, which I really think is very interesting, having to do with the immune system. And here you can see that this is kind of a more sophisticated version of a proofreading scheme with, scheme with multiple opportunities for proofreading. But the, the essential concept is the same as what I showed you. So here, the energy com consumption comes in the form of these phosphorylation reactions, and every phosphorylation reaction leads to the option of discriminating uh, yet again. And um, I, I also just wanted to say, you know, that you might amuse yourself by reading in the Feynman lectures the special lecture he gave on the Pat, the Ratchet and Paul, which is really fun. And with Vahe um, Galston, my student, uh, he, we we had a really good time trying to think about you know, driving this little allosteric machine using the Feynman ratchet and Paul, and you know, that, that's, that's mainly just for your entertainment. So this is what I have to say about the proofreading thing, and I, I will give a homework that will allow people to dig into it a little bit more deeply. But, you know, let me, let me really end with two things, an homage to uh, Ninio and to Hopfield for thinking up this beautiful idea, and then a wider claim that this whole idea about fidelity and defiance you know goes under it, it flies the flag of how much accuracy can you get how much energy do you have to spend and how fast will it go and part of the reason that i like using these pistons is that i it gives me sort of a knob to tune how much work um, i'm thinking of extracting from the external world in order to drive um, my system in the proofreading process so I think that this is, for the moment, going to be without, I'll give a little summary, but this is more or less the end of what I'm going to say for now on this issue of, of life as defiance.